This is a story about people and buildings and how they come together to create what we call architecture. To tell the story of the founding of the modern state of Israel is in part to tell the story of the founding or the construction of the modern city of Tel Aviv, now dubbed the White City. The story has a hero and that hero is the Bauhaus movement and philosophy that was born in Germany before the war. What is the Bauhaus? Why is Tel Aviv called the White City? What's the difference between Bauhaus and international style? What is the philosophy of the Bauhaus? And most importantly, how is this philosophy seen in the buildings in Tel Aviv in the White City? What is the Bauhaus? The Bauhaus has been called the style, but I prefer the word movement because style just reeks of superficiality. Um, it was a movement that was born in Germany. Um, Bauhaus literally means building house. It was a school, um, a design school, that was run by a German architect called Walter Gropius. The school ran in Dessau um, for most of its part. It started in Weimar, then went to Dessau where the famous Bauhaus building stands today. And then it's had a year or two in Berlin. It's telling to note the years that the Bauhaus school ran from, which is 1919 to 1932, almost exactly between the two great world wars. And this is significant because it shows us the thinking of young students and teachers at the time, uh, just after the great world war, the war, the war that the world had never seen before. And these are people that are rethinking their world around them, exploring, innovating, Walter Geropius gathered around himself an amalgamation of teachers that would teach all different kinds of arts. This is one of the philosophies of the school. Craft and art and everything to do with design. So there were classes in textiles, there were classes in colour, typography, furniture, printmaking, weaving and technical drawing. And the granddaddy of them all, architecture. All the ideas of the Bauhaus school ran contrary to the way architecture had been taught up until now. In the early 20th century, the word architecture was almost synonymous with classical building styles. And when I say classical, it's what we understand to be Roman and Greek styles of today. So it was not uncommon in the early 20s and even 30s for buildings to be built as if they to look like they were built in the 1800s. Bauhaus is all about breaking with the past, about seeing the world anew, afresh, and creating a style appropriate for the age, the modern age. What's the difference between the Bauhaus and the international style? Well, quite honestly, nothing. They're one and the same thing. Uh, the style was called the international style when the Americans got hold of it. They had an exhibition in 1932 at the Modern Museum of Art in New York at the MoMA, and the curators there, uh, Henry Russell Hitchcock and Philip Johnson, um, coined the phrase the international style. This exhibition had on display the Bauhaus building in Dessau, designed by Walter Gropius, as well as the work of the three most famous international uh, style architects, Miss van der Rohe in Germany, who was the director of the Bauhaus in its final years in Berlin, Le Corbusier from France, Switzerland, and Frank Lloyd Wright from America. The exhibition started in New York, but then went on a national tour around America that lasted for six years. The name makes sense. These were ideas and philosophies that were far-reaching, so far-reaching that they crossed borders and boundaries and crossed over the Atlantic Ocean. They were ideas that influenced the architecture as far-flung as South Africa, uh, where there are very many beautiful international style homes and building examples. Why is Tel Aviv called the White City? Tel Aviv has been called the White City lovingly by many of its first songwriters and poets. A view down the newly designed and built boulevard of white buildings is a postcard of the brave new world where the pioneers built the modern Israel or what was then called Palestine under the British mandate. This could just be a black and white photo because we know for a fact that many of the buildings were not exactly white. 
many were sandy colored some had a reddish tone some had a greenish tone to them um, but it doesn't matter at all the same way that the Parthenon we now know was not carved out of um, pure white marble standing as classical architectural icon but it was also painted so too it doesn't matter that the white city was not necessarily all white the name implies the mood, the feeling, the crispness, the laboratory feeling, the technology, the newness, and that's what's important and that's what's remained. Design philosophy number one, contrasting the old with the new. It's helpful to think about the ideas of the Bauhaus by contrasting what came before it. Um, when Europe was a grainy black and white movie, and the buildings that supported this kind of movie were solid, symmetrical, uh, heavy buildings. They were dark, uh, read oppressive, domineering, controlling. They spoke all about the wealth um, of the ruling class. Superfluous ornamentation, gilded balustrades, sewn surrounds to the windows. It all spoke about the abundance of the ruling class. Now, I've laden this text with some emotional uh, language in order to try and get an understanding of what the young students were feeling at the time. They had just emerged from what they thought was the last Great War. I was surprised they had come in. And they were trying to look at the world around them in a new, fresh way. Um, politically, socially, economically, and this is reflected architecturally. So the philosophy um, of this old versus new, I've taken this th one idea, which is that of symmetry versus asymmetry. And the idea of asymmetry is used in a lot of the Bauhaus um, designs, forms, even poster design, you'll see it um, in sculpture and in architecture. The idea is about balance as opposed to the balance that comes naturally from symmetry. The building that I'm going to be using is the Max Liebling house that was built in 1932 by Dov Kami uh, for Tony and Max Liebling in Tel Aviv in Edelston Street. And this has an asymmetrical facade as well as an asymmetrical plan. Now the famous Bauhaus building in Dessau was designed around what was called the pinwheel plan, which is an asymmetrical plan. So if you contrast, say, the plan of the Palace of Versailles, a very strong solid symmetry, and you look at the pinwheel design, you can see immediately that there is balance, but it is dynamic, offset. The Max Liebling House has the same pinwheel design. The Liebling House also has an asymmetrical facade, like many Bauhaus buildings in Tel Aviv. And if you look at the deep balconies, you can see the interplay between light and shadow. And this gives the illusion that the balconies, the horizontal forms, are indeed floating. There's a feeling of them being cantilevered. In 2015, the German government funded the restoration of the Liebling House and set it up as a museum and also as a centre from where the restoration of many of the buildings of Tel Aviv then emanate from. Um, earlier to this time, Tel Aviv was recognised as a World Heritage Site because it has the largest collection of Bauhaus buildings anywhere in the world. It has about 4,000 buildings and structures um, about 1,000 of which are now protected with a heritage status. Design philosophy number two, a uh, brave new world, designing from first principles. The Bauhaus came at a time when people had very strong beliefs. They debated things like politics, society, economics. They met in the proverbial coffee shop and they threshed out ideas about how to have better living conditions, better buildings, better cities. They wanted light and air for all, something that we take for granted today. They wanted a world where people could be free, free of oppression and equal. It should come as no surprise that the Jews who fled from Europe, first from pogroms and then from Nazi Germany, and came to Israel, held these ideas of a free, open society, new, fresh. There is a very famous picture of what has to be called pioneers, standing on the sandy beaches just outside of Jaffa. And they were allotting the new Ahuzat Bayit, the first neighborhood of Tel Aviv. And you can see how this is a formidable challenge, a clean, fresh slate. 
just sandy beaches, something they would have to design from first principles. The idea of designing from first principles is so strong a concept that even my own education at WITS, the University of Advertisement in Johannesburg in the 1990s, the idea of starting from first principles was the keystone of my education. Everything that we did, we drew, we modeled, we designed, it had to be uh, from a fresh start. There was no leaning on tradition. It was the Bauhaus buildings in Tel Aviv for the very concretization, pun intended, of this idea of a clean, fresh start. I want you to look at the house on Edelstein Street, just near the Libling House. It was designed by the famous Richard Kaufman in 1931. It also has cantilevered canopies over its windows um, and an asymmetrical facade. But I want you to focus on the idea of um, the cleanness of the facade, the white plaster, and also the uh, pure forms, um, the windows, just a cutout, no ornament, ornamentation, no decoration, just a window in its purest form, a puncture in a wall. Cut out, here it is, here I am. Design philosophy number three, style versus authenticity. The idea that something is useful or utilitarian, and this makes it beautiful, was a very strong idea that was held by artists and architects at the time. In 1917, Man Ray revealed his famous fountain, which was a ready-made urinal, and other found objects all spoke about seeing the beauty in utilitarian objects. Decoration is stripped away. The beauty is in the essence, in the truth of it. As early as 1908, Adolf Loos, an architect from Vienna, wrote his famous essay called Ornament and Crime, which he speaks about stripping away the decoration, getting down to the basic, to the bare essence of things, and thereby revealing the beauty in it. Style is something that's kitsch, it's a pastiche, it's something that's um, veneer thin, superficial, and something that won't necessarily last in the conscious of the community. The White City has endured because of the depth and clarity of their ideas and how they are seen within the building. Bauhaus buildings in the White City are what they say they are. Sounds pretty Israeli to me. The columns or the piloti seem to hold up the building, and indeed they do hold up the building. The ribbon windows show us that there is no need for heavy walls in order to keep up the roof. So we can puncture it in which way we want. We can have long fenestration if we like. It reveals the structure. You can clearly pick out where the stairs are, where the vertical, what they call thermometer windows run. You can see where the balconies are, where the living spaces are. Everything is revealed. There's transparency to it. This is made real in House Rubinsky on 65 Shinkin Street. It was built by Lucien Korngold. House Rubinsky really has all of the five points of the new architecture that Le Corbusier speaks about. It has the Pilotti, the liberated facade, the ribbon windows, the free floor pan, and the flat roof with the garden above. The building design is inspired by the great ocean liners, the icons of the machine age. The details here include the round sort of bull's eye windows and the steel piping used as the railing elements. And from the side, the balconies have a rounded look that look like an ocean liner. Design philosophy number four, a belief in technology. One of the main principles that was taught at the Bauhaus School was mass production and factory fabrication. This idea of technology leading the way um, made it through not only in the product design and in furniture design, but also in architecture and architectural design. Le Corbusier's idea that buildings were a machine for living in is reflected in a lot of the buildings, much like the ocean liner look that we had from before. The house I want to show you is House Bionski, built by the architect Pinchus Bionski in 1936. It is raised up on a plinth that has a ground floor for what was the latest technology at the time, the automobile. It has the light steel balustrades, which were fabricated materials and an advanced new technology of material, and steel and glass windows as the 
thermometer windows for the staircase. Hope you've enjoyed this video if you have ideas for more buildings that you would like to see let me know